Knowing how to write a full Mark Macbeth essay is hard. Especially because you're going to be doing it often in exam conditions, you've got tight time. However, there are some strategies that are really important to keep in mind in helping you get the very highest grades. And that is what I'm going to be focused on talking to you about today. The first thing we need to consider is just what is an argument and why is it important? Because essentially an argument is your answer to the question that you've been asked in the exam. And in that sense, it's incredibly important because you want your answer to the question to be relevant to the question. One of the really common mistakes that hold people back from getting the very highest marks is they end up just writing everything they know in a kind of just regurgitation, splurge, in my head, giant wave, green goo kind of thing of everything they know about that character or about that theme or just about Macbeth in general. What arguments are about is that you're focused, you're specific, you've got an angle you're looking to talk about in your answer and you stick to that angle. That's part of the key to a really good answer to an essay question because the examiner knows that there's loads of different things you could have talked about and they also know that you know how to narrow your focus down to a key area. And that with that key area you've narrowed down to, there's that question of how simple an idea is it versus how complex and sophisticated an idea it is. And I'm gonna look in this video up, uh, you know, what does that mean having a simple or a complex idea about the play Macbeth? And again, that's really important because of course, if you've just got a really simple basic idea that is not showing as deep an understanding of the play as a much more complex idea. So of course the complex idea is going to get more marks, is going to do better. The argument is also really important because it's like the skeleton for your entire essay. You might have incredible analysis, but if it isn't serving an argument, if it's not serving a clear purpose, it's gonna fall a bit flat because it's like, okay, great, yeah, the semantic field creates this effect, sure, why do I care? That's the key thing I think the argument is answering, that why do I give a damn? <laughs> that key question, you're telling your reader like, all of this analysis is really, really important because it serves to prove this argument. All of this stuff I'm saying about context is really important because it serves to prove this argument. Your argument is the whole reason why anyone is bothering to, you know, listen to you at this point in time. And when it comes to actually writing a grade nine argument across the exam boards, Okay, and this I think also encompasses regardless of whether you're doing this in exam conditions or as a coursework, there are typically three things they're looking for at the highest grade level for a Macbeth essay. The first is that you are evaluative, they sometimes word it as being critical. I'll explain again in more detail, specifically with Macbeth, what that looks like, but in general, that means that you're not looking at something as like, there's one way of looking at it, there's one angle, there's right, there's wrong. You're looking at the, the 50 shades of grey, if you will, of the situation, you're looking at the complexity, it's like it could be like this, but it also can be like this. There's also an evaluative aspect in judging that question of why. Why is uh, a character, Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, Banquo, why are they presented a certain way? And you're kind of like, you're evaluating, you're judging, or oh, it could be because of this, it could be because of this. So evaluation of being critical is not critical in the sense of Shakespeare is rubbish, why are we still studying him? The guy's been dead for 500 years, let's just all go on Twitter and, and read through Elon Musk speed that's way more useful. It's not that kind of critical. It's much more the kind of could it be this but it could also be this and that kind of nuance of discussion there versus just being like there is one answer, I will give one answer, end of conversation. The second thing they're classically looking for is being perceptive. You know how I was saying before about the simple to complex spectrum? Perceptive means you're at the complex end of the spectrum and that is very heavily tied into being evaluative. If you're being evaluative, then it's very possible you are also being perceptive because you know, you're know you looking at the complexity of a situation and it could be this, it could be that. It is possible to be perceptive without being evaluative though by just having an idea that is 
really insightful and showing a deep understanding of the play in a way that other students don't typically and again I feel like I keep saying this but I'm saying it because it's true I am going to talk about this more in a little bit with specific reference to Macbeth but typically with Macbeth the form that that takes is your ability to look at how characters are being used as tools rather than just talking about them as if they're real people. The third thing is about thoroughness. So it's all well and good having an amazing argument that you set up in your introduction, but is that then what you talk about in your main body? Do you then actually prove that argument via analysis and the like? If the answer is no, then you're not gonna be able to get into that top mark area, that full mark grade nine area. You have to be able to set up a killer argument and sustain it all the way through. You have to be able to prove it. So that's why argument and analysis can't ever be completely separated. Analysis only makes sense because of the argument and the argument is only proven by the analysis. So, you know, they are BFFs forever and you need to be thinking about the two. Now, I'm not talking about analysis in this video because the skill of analysis is not necessarily going to change for Macbeth versus An Inspector Calls versus Jekyll and Hyde versus Still I Rise. It's gonna be the same, essentially, whatever text you're looking at, the skills are the same. So if you're looking for that guidance on how to analyze to a really high level, have a look at some of my videos on that. My videos on how to analyze the strategies for analyzing to a high level, how to analyze a poem structure, blah, 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 you get the idea. Just have a look at those instead. But here we're focusing just on how to get that, like framework right, how to get the bones, the skeleton of your essay right, so that you can then, you know, put some muscle, put some, I don't want to keep going with this metaphor because it's going to become really creepy. I already mentioned this a little bit, which I shouldn't have because I'm going to be mentioning it again so soon, but with all these three, the evaluative, the perceptive, the thorough, the key strategy to getting all of that with a Macbeth essay is that you are essentially going to examine how characters are used as tools by Shakespeare to convey wider messages. One of my biggest pet peeves in the world of English is talking about characters as if they are real people. Macbeth is conflicted, oh poor him, his wife's being mean to him, but he isn't real. Like yes he is conflicted because Shakespeare is presenting him as so in order to explore a particular idea and that's the kind of focus you need to have in your Macbeth essays. It's not Macbeth is, it's Shakespeare presents Macbeth as in order to. That's the kind of key distinction. I'm going to start off uh, with the more specific strategies by showing you what I mean by the simple versus complex, that perceptive idea. And we're going to look at it with this example question of how is Lady Macbeth presented. Now, a classic answer to this question would be that a student would say she is evil and she's manipulative. Fine. There's a couple of issues with this. First of all, it's talking about Lady Macbeth as if she is a real person. Not great. Second of all, it's very like one-sided. There is one answer and that's it. There's not much complexity to her. She just is evil. She just is manipulative. On the other hand, a more perceptive idea would look more like this. She's used as a means of questioning whether it is possible to challenge gender norms. Manipulative proves she challenges. Tormented by guilt proves she can't. I mean, I know like just looking at that, a lot of students would go, oh, okay, the second one uses a lot more words and it sounds fancy, so that must be the high mark one. So I just wanna jump in here and point out, more words does not equal more marks, people. I cannot tell you how many essays of utter waffle I have read that actually have not remotely been perceptive. Fancy words does not equal a grade nine. Writing five words when you could have written one does not equal a grade nine. What does equal a grade nine is having a clear thematic link when you're answering a question about character. So focusing on how that character is being used as a tool by Shakespeare to explore a particular theme, to convey a particular message, and like almost starting with that thematic link 
and then therefore how the character is presented. And then when you're looking at how the character is presented, you want to try to have contrasting ideas so that you're able to look at the complexity. And that is 100% possible with the characters of, well, not every character, but of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, for sure. Like, you are going to be able to look at how they are like this in the beginning, but then they're really different by the end or by the middle or something like that. They have a lot of character development. So you want to make sure that when you're having your ideas of how they're presented, you're looking at that contrast. For your characters that don't have much contrast, let's say if you've got unlikely but possible question of something like just how is Banquo presented, what you're going to do there is a very useful trick. Banquo, King Duncan, Macduff, uh, Malcolm, they are all designed to be the foil to Macbeth. Now foil is an actual literary device. I'm not talking about the aluminium stuff you wrap your sandwiches in. A foil is like a character that is designed to be like an opposite of somebody else. So Banquo, Macduff, Malcolm, etc. They are all designed to be the foil of Macbeth because they're his opposite. So what you're going to be able to do is first of all, let's say again it was how is Banquo presented. You're going to be able to start off with the thematic link to Banquo. What is the point of Banquo's existence? And the point of Banquo's existence is all about exploring how it is possible to not let ambition get to you, to be truly loyal and so on and so forth and maintain your loyalty and your moral compass. In order for him to be the foil to Macbeth. Because then what you can do in your essay is you can examine how Banquo is presented and then keep coming in with how that makes him the opposite to Macbeth. This isn't you going off topic of the question because the whole point of the play Macbeth is Macbeth. He is the point. So all the other characters are essentially about serving his character. So what you, you can say that in your introduction, the character of Banquo and how he is presented is inextric inextricably tied to Macbeth and how Macbeth is presented and what we're supposed to be taking from that. And therefore, to examine Banquo, to examine King Duncan, to examine Malcolm, you must also examine their relationship with Macbeth, how they contrast with Macbeth. And you can then kind of keep going back and forth. So I know I've gone off on a little tangent here, but that's just an important top tip I have. For those of you that are dealing with having to write essays about the smaller characters, bring them back to the big boy, bring them back to Macbeth and how they are uh, really important there. The same is still true of Lady Macbeth. If you've got a question on Lady Macbeth, you can look at how she is, she's not a foil to Macbeth, obviously, but how she's like a parallel, you know? Um, how she influences him, how she follows a similar path to him and then how she ends up being completely different. Yeah, you can examine that similarity and difference between the, the paths the two characters go on. That being said, Lady Macbeth is definitely a meaty enough character for you to just talk about her on her own without masses about Macbeth. So for Lady Macbeth, I'd say just talk about her. So what I've written here is just like note form of the perceptive idea. But another thing that's important to keep in mind when you're trying to write out your idea is how you express yourself. You want to express yourself in a formal, concise and clear way because that is a key level of just academic writing in general. So I'm gonna give you an example. So what I've got here is a like, skeleton. I know I've already said skeleton for your argument, but this is like a skeleton in your skeleton. You've got... Yeah, I really need to lose this skeleton analogy. We've got this example of an introduction you can use in an essay where essentially you can like plug in the gaps um, in order to answer a huge range of questions. And then it can be, you know, it can help you with having that eloquent structure every time. So I've already plugged in the first gap. Shakespeare's presentation of Lady Macbeth. But of course, if the question wasn't Lady Macbeth, if the question was Banquo, if the question was Macbeth, if the question was the old man at the gate, don't worry, it will never be the old man at the gate, then you can just put that character name in instead. But it runs like this. Shakespeare's presentation of Lady Macbeth is inextricably tied to his exploration of X. Now in that first box goes the theme. Just name the theme inextricably tied to his exploration of ambition, kingship, tyranny, violence, gender, 
whatever it is that you are saying is the key theme that links to this character. That's the first way that you're narrowing your argument down. Because again, if we think about the character of Macbeth, he is tied to every single theme that the play explores. So you're narrowing down to focus on one particular theme. So once you've identified the theme, you then use a colon, nice eloquent style of helping make sure your sentences say can stay concise but also clear and you say one of the key message of messages of the play is x now in that second spot that is where you would say a key idea for that theme that you put in the first spot so inextricably tied to his exploration of ambition one of the key messages of the play is what it is that Shakespeare wants to say about ambition. And again, there's multiple ideas that Shakespeare has. So you're narrowing down again by being like, I'm gonna focus on this part of the theme. You then come in with the final sentence. This serves to explain why Lady Macbeth is initially presented as X and then later presented as X. That's where your two adjectives go in of the different ways you would describe Lady Macbeth. Lady Macbeth towards the start, Lady Macbeth towards the end. One big warning about adjectives. Prepare these in advance. Make that part of your Macbeth revision. Thinking about the adjectives you can use to describe the characters before the King Duncan's death or before the witch's prophecies, whatever it is that's your kind of like beginning of the play, middle of the play, end of the play, however you're defining it make sure you've thought about those adjectives and make sure you've thought about them carefully. You need to make sure you truly understand what the words mean. The reason I say that is because so many students will use an adjective when they think they know what it means. Then an English teacher goes to read their essay and thinks, that isn't a very accurate, like it's close, but it's not completely accurate. You need to make sure that your adjective is 100% accurate. And so you need to double check it at Collins Dictionary and make sure it means what you think it means and that its meaning definitely applies to the character you're talking about. Once you've got this introduction, it's not very long, it's only three sentences, but once you've got this introduction, you've clearly placed in your argument the, the outline of what it is you're going to talk about, you've given it that thematic focus and you've clearly established your conflicting adjectives. So you're putting yourself in a nice strong position here. But as I've said, just that introduction is not gonna immediately put you in the grade nine category for a key reason. You haven't proven it yet. So it's gonna then come down to your main body and what you say there that's gonna be key in actually getting that highest grade because you set yourself up for a high grade but you've got to sustain it in the actual main body of the essay as well. When it comes to questions about theme, the strategy is slightly different, but still very similar. To show you what I mean, we're gonna use this example question of how is the theme of ambition presented? And again, I'm gonna start off by showing you that difference between your simple idea versus your more complex perceptive idea. So first of all, ambition is not good because it makes you do bad things. That's how Shakespeare presents ambition. Versus, Shakespeare presents it as the conflict between one, one's own ambition and the moral obligation to society as exemplified by Macbeth. Warning here. Yes, eloquence has played a part. The first one is phrased with very basic language. The second is phrased with much more sophisticated language. But it is not the sophisticated language alone that makes it a perceptive idea. It is that the sophisticated language is more accurate than the simple language. Not good is incredibly vague and wide reaching in what it potentially means. Moral obligation to society is very specific in what it means. So again, don't just use a thesaurus to chuck out a bunch of fancy words that mean utterly nothing because it's a pain in English teachers behinds. They'd much rather you were just clear in what you were saying. That being said, make sure your vocabulary is as specific as you can make it. The more specific, the more accurate you are, the better you're going to do because you're showing a more specific and accurate understanding of the play. And am I the only one for whom the word specific is just like lost all meaning? The key trick that I'm uh, trying to demonstrate in this example of how to talk about themes is essentially always look at a conflict in the theme. If we look more closely at this one, the conflict between one's own ambition and the moral obligation to society, it's like Shakespeare is saying, ambition is this, but also there's this over here. And that is true of like every single theme of Macbeth. When you're looking at the theme of kingship, it's 
good kingship versus tyranny. When you're looking at the theme of violence, it's violence that is justified and violence that is not justified. Fate versus free will, the conflict is baked into its name. It's about fate versus free will and which one's in control. All of the themes have some kind of conflict, so always find that versus. It's about this versus this. And again, that's something you're going to be able to prepare in advance of the exam. You're going to have been able to do your revision, to think about all the different themes. And if you've got that theme, what is the conflict that you would talk about? The other thing you want to do to help narrow the focus of your essay is then pick one maximum of two characters that you're going to explore that conflict through. So with uh, this one on ambition, I picked Macbeth. I could have also picked Lady Macbeth. The reason that you might want to pick one is if there's a lot you can say for that one character. On the other hand, actually, the conflict in the theme is exemplified by the conflict between two characters. Like if we take the theme of kingship versus tyranny, Macbeth is the tyranny, King Duncan and Malcolm are the kingship. And so when you're exploring that theme of kingship, you're going to be able to look at King Duncan slash Malcolm for the good kingship and then contrast that with our tyrannical Macbeth in order to really explore what Shakespeare's trying to say on that theme. So again here I've got for you an introduction, a little model introduction where you're going to be able to plug in the gaps for dealing with questions about themes. So it just starts off in exploring the theme of X. So in that box just goes whatever the theme is in the question. And you then follow that with Shakespeare sought to explore the conflict between X and X. That's where your verses goes in. Fate and free will. Um, the kingship and tyranny justified and unjustified violence, whatever it is that you're saying is the verses. And then you finish that off with this conflict is keenly exemplified in the presentation of, and that's where you put your characters. So the presentation of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, of Macbeth and King Duncan, or so on and so forth. Again, it's nice and short. When you're in the exam, you don't need to put masses and masses in your introduction. You just want to sort of establish what it is you're going to be talking about, and then you focus on like going into more detail, more development in your main body. If you're doing Macbeth as a coursework, you probably do want to flesh this out. And my top tip of how to flesh it out is with a reference to context. So you would add on to this, and this is true for character questions as well. You would add on a fourth, wait, no, third sentence or fourth sentence if you're dealing with my character example, basically explaining how the context around the Jacobean era, Shakespeare, the Christian faith, the divine right of kings, King James the first, whatever it is, how that context has influenced what Shakespeare's key messages are for that theme um, and or how it has influenced the presentation of a particular character. One important thing to remember though is that you need to double check that you are actually marked on context. I'm pretty sure all the exam boards um, assess context for Macbeth, but just double check in case you're a weird exam board that doesn't, because if they don't mark you on context, there's no point talking about it. Once you've nailed that introduction and you've got that initial like, here's my grade nine idea, it's now time to prove it. And so for that, we need to think about what you need to keep doing in the main body of your essay to sustain that grade nine argument. So if we're dealing with the questions on character, your basic pattern is gonna look like this. You're going to look at the character before. Now, what they are before will vary depending on what you've chosen to focus on. For example, you could do Macbeth before and after he kills King Duncan or Macbeth before or after he hears the witch's prophecies. Lady Macbeth would be a different situation because with Lady Macbeth, she's still pretty similar immediately after the killing of King Duncan. So it's like Lady Macbeth before she feels the guilt versus after she feels the guilt. Either way, you're aiming to basically structure your essay so that you get to examine character development. Those contrasting adjectives that you would have put into your introduction, you're going to examine those. The character before, that's your first adjective. The character after, that's your other contrasting. And you're gonna end with a short conclusion that just establishes like, why has there been this development? One thing to note, if I go back to what I was saying before about what if you've got a, a smaller character like Banquo and how you can use Macbeth as a way to help flesh out an essay on Banquo, in that case, you're not going to follow this structure 
this structure um, because there is no before and after for Banquo. He's just, he stays the same the whole way through. Instead, you would be like, here's one trait of Banquo and in that same idea, how it contrasts with Macbeth. Here's a second trait of Banquo and how it contrasts Macbeth. So that's how you're going to flesh out your essay there. You essentially just want two adjectives. They're not going to be contrasting because the likes of Banquo and King Duncan and Malcolm and so on, they don't have character development. They stay the same. So instead, you're just going to have two adjectives to describe them. But for each adjective, you'll contrast them to the main man, Mackie B. When we're dealing with theme, on the other hand, we have a slightly different structure where we look at, you know, how in your introduction you establish what the conflict is in the theme? Well, that's then how you structure your essay. So you first look at the first part of the conflict, so uh, good kingship, and then the second part of conflict versus tyranny. And you would prove that uh, part of it is exploring what makes a good king, and then prove that it's also exploring the harms of tyranny. And then your conclusion is, what is the key message we're supposed to be taking away from this conflict, from this fate versus free will, um, ambition versus moral obligation to society, etc, etc. What is it we as the audience are supposed to be taking away from that? So it's almost like you're asking, not how the conflict resolves, but Whose side in the conflict are we as the audience supposed to be on? Does Shakespeare want us to think tyranny is the way to go or does he want us to think good kingship is the way to go? Does he want us to believe that moral obligation to society is the way to go or does he want us to believe your own ambition no matter what is the way to go? Like which side do you think Shakespeare wants us to be on considering everything that you've said? I haven't broken this main body structure down by number of paragraphs. A lot of students will often say to me, Miss, how many paragraphs should I write? How many paragraphs? And here's the thing, at grade nine, that's not a question to ask because it's not about how many paragraphs. You could write seven paragraphs of utter rubbish and you could write three that would get you full marks. The key to a high mark answer is that you know the Goldilocks system. You know not to write too much and be too unfocused and keep talking. You also know not to write too little and not prove your idea and not have any analysis. You know how to get it just right. You know how many paragraphs you need, how much analysis you need to do in order to fully prove your idea. It is possible that this structure, and same goes for the character one, is essentially four paragraphs. Introduction, first part of conflict, second part of conflict, conclusion. The, the two in the middle, the first part and second part of the conflict will be humongous because of the amount of analysis you're gonna do, but it is possible that you could write it as four paragraphs. That being said, you might break it down further. So when looking at the first part of the conflict, let's say for kingship, you might break it down and do three paragraphs. I'm going to do a paragraph on how being a good king requires you to, I don't know, develop your subjects. Then I'm going to do a paragraph on how being a good king means that you are fair and just and loyal. And then I'm going to do a paragraph on how being a good king means that you embody Christian values. So actually, looking at the first part of the conflict, you've spent three paragraphs talking about it because you've broken up what being a good king means. There's no formula for the number of paragraphs, you have to be able to judge what it is you're going to talk about and how many paragraphs that is going to take, which is a skill that comes with practice and also revision. You know who's in Macbeth. You know what the themes are of Macbeth. There is hypothetically nothing stopping you from planning and writing an essay for every single character and every single theme and nailing it in advance of your exam. The next thing I want to talk about is just a strategy for how you uh, start the first sentence of each of your paragraphs in your main body to stop them from being repetitive from your introduction. So to show you what I mean, first of all, we've got here an introduction for that how is Lady Macbeth presented question. Shakespeare's presentation of Lady Macbeth is inextricably tied to his exploration of gender. One of the key messages of the play is the impossibility of separating yourself from gender norms. This serves to explain why Lady Macbeth is initially presented as manipulative, a masculine trait, and then later presented as guilt-ridden, a feminine trait. So that's the introduction. Now imagining that I wanted to have my section on Lady Macbeth 
initially as manipulative and my section on Lady Macbeth later as guilt ridden. How am I actually going to phrase that in my paragraphs? One thing that students often do is they essentially just repeat themselves. So they would start the first section with the sentence Lady Macbeth is initially presented as manipulative and masculine trait and then when they hit their next section they say Lady Macbeth is later presented as guilt ridden a feminine trait. They just repeat word for word what they've already said. That is not a good thing to do. The reason for that is you're not showing any development from your introduction. You're just literally repeating yourself. You need to add on a new layer to this idea. And the key way to do that is with one of the greatest words in the English language, because. Lady Macbeth is initially presented as manipulative due to her coercive behaviour towards Macbeth. Lady Macbeth is later presented as guilt-ridden because of her inability to accept her role in King Duncan's death. There we go. So what you can see there is that by using because or due to, you are able to develop by getting more specific about how we see that presentation. That then can feed into the evidence and the analysis that you do. Of course, a really important thing to note here in wording is that right now it reads as if I'm talking about the character, talking about Lady Macbeth, as if she is a real person. If you do that in your uh, opening topic sentence, make sure you then sort that out in your analysis, as I'm gonna show you in a second. You come back to what Shakespeare is trying to say. You can also sort it out in your uh, initial sentences though, by phrasing it as, uh, Shakespeare initially presents Lady Macbeth as, Shakespeare later presents her as. Just chuck Shakespeare's name in there and that will help you make sure that you're placing that emphasis on what the writer is doing. As well as getting those opening sentences of your paragraphs right. It's also important to make sure you come back to, at the end of your paragraphs, you come back to your argument. So you can see an example on the side here. Lady Macbeth is initially presented as manipulative due to her coercive behaviour towards Macbeth. You then do a bunch of glorious analysis and then you link your analysis back to your original argument. This coercive behaviour ultimately makes Lady Macbeth appear to subvert Jacobean feminine gender norms as she is able to successfully adopt the traits of a man and use them to gain more power. So you've come back to your argument. Make sure you link your analysis back to your argument. They're best friends. They don't like to be separated. Keep coming back to how they relate to one another. Keep coming back to what your analysis has to do with your argument. That's another really important part of getting that grade nine argument sustained the whole way through. I know I said I wasn't going to talk about um, how to do grade nine analysis here because I've got other videos on that skill generally, but there is just one aspect I really want to hammer home about Macbeth. One of the amazing things about Shakespeare is that there are really often multiple ways to interpret the quotes in the play. And that really plays into your argument in terms of trying to be evaluative and critical. To show you what I mean, I've got a quote here from towards the beginning of the play when Lady Macbeth says, Come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. So she's asking for spirits to come and give her the strength to be able to manipulate Macbeth and go ahead with killing King Duncan. Now, there's two different ways of analysing this. On the one hand, she is subverting gender norms because she has called on spirits to unsex her. You can analyse that imperative, you can analyse the uh, metaphor and being filled from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty, all of that, and how that shows that she has successfully been able to subvert gender expectations. On the other hand, you can flip it 180. The fact that she has to tell spirits to do that to her, she has to call for it, shows that it isn't natural. Thinking of that theme, unnatural versus natural in Macbeth, it doesn't come naturally to her. So actually, she wasn't subverting gender expectations herself, she was having to ask something else to do it. So that again links to uh, Shakespeare's ideas about gender because Shakespeare's whole underlying argument is it's not possible to fight against your gender norms and the way you naturally are. Um, because of course back then they thought gender was you know the natural way you are as opposed to a social construct. So when we think about analysing this quote, we've got two great different angles on the exact same quote and that is something where possible you want to try to do in your essays. Look at how 
one quote can be interpreted in two different ways. A way that a quote can show Macbeth is both in control and out of control, powerful and powerless, all of that good stuff, because that is really going to help you with getting that evaluative, critical aspect, not just in your argument, but also in your analysis too. So the last thing I'm going to do is just recap everything I've said in this video. First basic top tip is that you always need to have a thematic focus. What that means is that you talk about how characters are used as tools by Shakespeare. You place a lot of emphasis on talking about Shakespeare's intentions, what are his ideas that he's trying to get across. And you also look at the contextual influences, what was going on at the time that is influencing how Shakespeare presents these characters but also why the key messages of the play are what they are. How does the Christian faith of the Jacobean era influence Macbeth's decision to present good king versus tyranny, for example? The second key thing is you want to make sure you're always being evaluative by studying conflicts. Look at conflicting character development, ways that characters can be like this, but also like this, multiple ways of interpreting quotes and with the themes, don't just look at it in a simple way of this is all Shakespeare is saying, look at it as the conflict. For every single theme, there's this idea of is it this or is it this? Is it this or is it this? And always examine how Shakespeare is exploring the two sides to that conflict. <laughs>